For decades, the University of Alberta has been a world leader in transplant surgery research. It offers the broadest range of transplant procedures in Canada. This film takes us on a journey through some of its groundbreaking discoveries, stunning successes, and into the future. Okay, so transplantation started at the University of Alberta and in Western Canada basically uh, with kidney transplants and our first was done in 1967 by Dr. William Lakey. It was a, at a very important milestone and it's led on to an expansion that's been dramatic. We have heart, lung, liver, kidney, pancreas, islet, small intestine and the whole range of cell transplant therapies which is becoming an important new part of clinical delivery as well. And it's not just the breadth of, of, of the programs, but the depth as well. The volume of numbers, uh, the, the care provided has is, is, is really uh, uh, become quite important in terms of our, our delivery of care. Our center does over 350 clinical transplants every year. And that leads to a total, in fact, of over 7,500 that have been done since the program started. Those numbers are, are, are important. And in fact, if we take just our liver transplant program, we have over a thousand patients basically that are alive today with a, a functioning liver transplant. What makes the Department of Surgery so unique in Edmonton, and I have to attribute Tom Williams to that, is there's not only clinicians, but he's hired basic scientists. And I'm one of those basic scientists that he hired uh, you know, to, in the Department of Surgery. And so it's a mixture of clinicians and basic scientists. And so when we built, uh, when a, a, a student, a surgical fellow takes on a program, usually he, he's supervised, co-supervised with a basic scientist. And it's been a good mix of clinicians with basic scientists. And I think that's what makes our Department of Surgery uh, so unique, is a mixture of clinicians with basic scientists. And so, and like I, I indicated earlier, this is where I started my research in the audit program, uh, and then went on and we developed the, the audit group. Uh, carried out Canada's first islet transplant in 1989 and then went on and developed uh, with the islet group and James Shapiro uh, with the Edmonton Protocol and that program continues to flourish to this day. Dr. James Shapiro is one of the award-winning surgeons and scientists whose mission is to cure type 1 diabetes. On this planet right now, there's 7.7 .7 billion people. One in 11 have diabetes. It's a massive healthcare problem and it's expanding. It costs every year $1.32 trillion to manage diabetes and its complications globally. Not as it killing patients, strokes, heart disease, renal failure, amputations, blindness, but it's killing our healthcare system. So we need something better to control this disease. I came to the University of Alberta to come and learn surgery, to come and learn liver transplantation. Here in Edmonton, I knew there was a really strong base of research in, in, in islets in the previous track records. So what we're trying to do with the cell transplant is place the islets or islet-like cells or in the future stem cells into the liver or into other sites so that they can respond as normally as they possibly could do uh, to variable, variable changes in, in blood sugar control. So if we want to get to a cell transplant treatment that really could be a complete replacement for insulin for type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the future, we'd like to get to a point where we use less of the anti-rejection drugs. Anti-rejection drugs are good, I mean thousands and thousands of patients take them, but they do have some side effects. So if we could get to a point where we could carry out a transplant without needing those uh, drugs or using far less of them, we would have a, a cure. We've treated now uh, in Edmonton around 650 islet cell transplants have been carried out into the liver in around just under 300 patients. Uh, that's the biggest program anywhere in the world. 
What we've done with our next step work with stem cells is we've taken two different kinds of stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells and there are these cells called iPS cells. We've been working for the last 20 years. I've had a collaboration with a group in San Diego called Biocyte. They develop techniques for taking small samples of cells from a blastocyst, from a five-day-old discarded embryo from an IVF clinic that was ethically derived and family provided consent. And just from that one single embryo, they've been able to expand up a completely limitless source of cells that could supply the entire world population with type 1 and type 2 diabetes in theory. With those cells, however, you have to take anti-rejection drugs or you have to put them into a device that shields them from the immune system. We're working with a gene editing company called CRISPR Therapeutics to see if we can gene edit the surface of those cells to reduce the HLA expression and maybe add co-inhibitory molecules on top of that that will prevent those cells from being rejected. The idea would be you could have a universal cell, therefore, that would be able to make insulin but would be shielded from the immune attack. This approach will be tested in patients, I anticipate, in, in 2021, 2022, as we develop that from testing in the lab to taking to patients. In parallel, at the same time, we've been following the recipes for manufacturing iPS cells. So what we do there, to put it really simply, is we take a blood sample from patients, and then we follow this 27-day protocol to turn those cells into islet-like cells. And now, for the first time, we've been able to make these cells from humans with diabetes and, and put those cells into mice. And the, for the very first time, we've been able to reverse diabetes in mice with those cells. So we're very, very excited about that approach. Uh, but the idea there would be we'd have patients' own cells uh, that would be completely biologically compatible uh, for a transplant, so you wouldn't need the anti-rejection drugs. The University of Alberta's elite researchers are constantly expanding global knowledge about type 1 diabetes. Dr. Gina Riot, preserving islet cells to boost the numbers available for transplantation. Dr. Greg Corbett and Dr. Andrew Pepper, improving islet cell grafting efficiency. Dr. Colin Anderson, deepening our knowledge of the immune system to eliminate the need for immunosuppressive drugs. Dr. Laurie West leads the Alberta Transplant Institute. It brings together clinicians, researchers, and educators from multiple diverse fields, all dedicated to advancing transplantation in Canada and across the world. Transplantation by its very nature is people from a heterogeneous variety of backgrounds. Uh, surgeons, physicians, cardiologists, hepatologists, nephrologists, so that they, they come from all different backgrounds into the field of transplantation. Almost anything touches transplantation in one way or another because of the vast numbers of people that participate in the care of transplant patients. What we've learned from engaging patients in research is that one of the things that they're most concerned about that matters the most to them in transplantation is the need to take immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of their lives. Priority for them has been to find ways where we might be able to minimize the needs for, for the, the drugs, the medications that are required after transplantation. So one area of research that's developed out of understanding that patient priority is a new way of suppressing the immune response, the rejection response, by using cells that our body makes that do that all the time. And these are called regulatory T cells. These are a special kind of immune cell whose very function is to dampen down immune responses. We've actually discovered a new source of regulatory T cells. In tissues from children, these tissues are normally discarded. They're normally thrown away. So we call this garbage to gold. The goal is to turn them into a powerful tool that can, we hope, replace immunosuppressive drugs or at least help us use them perhaps in smaller quantities. The University of Alberta has ranked number sixth in the world in uh, the university world rankings in terms of the field of transplantation. So that's based, of course, on decades of powerful clinical care in transplantation, but also on groundbreaking research. And the research that we see going forward that will continue to change the face of transplantation is tapping into the power of of artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us understand through complex, very complex algorithms, 
how, how we can best match organs to patients to allow for optimal outcomes down the road. We bring together these strengths and create synergies that are far more powerful than if they had not existed before. Veteran surgeon scientist, Dr. Ron Moore, guides Dr. Alejandro Mayerson in his fellowship. Together, they are shaping the future of kidney transplantation. So right now in transplantation, uh, the biggest limitation is the supply of organs. A lot of our donors are older donors that die of other causes. They're people with pre-existing disease. And that provides a challenge to us in predicting which kidneys are going to work, how well they're going to work, and who the kidney should be allocated to. With Alejandro, uh, right now we're working on a project to look at can pump kidneys predict whether or not they're going to function and how well they're going to function. This fellowship is a mix between clinical and research uh, activity, so uh, that means going early to the hospital, seeing in patients, then doing assessments on potential recipients, also uh, doing assessments for uh, healthy living donors, uh, participating in the surgeries, in the procurements. So it's a mix of the daily activities of a transplant surgeon uh, and being in the meetings with the nephrologists and the pathologists and the immunologists as well. So this gives the opportunity to work in a multidisciplinary uh, team with people from medicine, immunology and pathology and the whole sphere of transplantation. The gratification in transplantation is, is really the surgery itself. Uh, I think it, from a technical aspect it has um, reconstructive surgery and dealing with vessels, the ureter, uh, the kidney, uh, and in procuring the kidney. And uh, so the, technically, wouldn't you say that uh, it's, it's one of the more rewarding surgeries? It's one of the most technical surgeries and you get a good sense of gratification every time you see a functioning kidney once, once you hook it up. Uh, and at the same time, if you're giving somebody the opportunity to go back to, to their normal life and being able to be active in society again and not being hooked up to a machine. So it's, it's giving them a second chance in life and I think that's very important for them. Adding to the multidisciplinary strength of the Department of Surgery is a hepatologist. Dr. Panida Tandon innovates. She has developed an app to help liver transplant patients stay strong and healthy prior to their surgeries. So what do we know about transplant patients? Patients who are having chronic disease or awaiting transplant for organ failure, we know that they have really high rates of sarcopenia and really high rates of frailty. So they're, in general, as their condition progresses, they get weaker and weaker. In clinic, what we were telling them is, listen, you need to stay strong, you need to eat well, you need to exercise. But unfortunately, we weren't giving them tools necessarily to implement that into their daily life. And so that's how the app came about. I mean, there's tons of apps out there for fitness right now. Um, but we didn't think that there was anything really that was out there that our patients with chronic disease, and particularly those awaiting transplant, could necessarily use. Number one, the exercises are geared towards people who uh, you know, are functioning at a, at a higher level for activity. And so our exercises in the app go all the way from bed exercises uh, to, to higher level exercises that can actually be done in a high intensity hit class type of thing. This virtual platform that we're all going to be playing in in the next century is, it's, it's here. And people are becoming much more technologically savvy. So we know that despite perceptions, 80 to 90% of our patients have smartphones and devices that they can use this digital technology. So that is not a gap anymore. Little Mason was born with only half a functioning heart. But thanks to surgeons who can operate on blood vessels only one millimeter wide, and the internationally recognized Stollery Children's Hospital, today he skips and plays with his mom. First I was diagnosed when I was pregnant with Mason, when he had, he was only at half of a heart that was functioning. We tried a whole bunch of surgeries. We had long stays in the hospital. We were eventually released on home oxygen and feeding tubes. He was on 24-hour feeds. 
medications every two hours. And then we were realizing that the fixes weren't working. So we were hoping to be listed for a heart transplant. We weren't sure if we were gonna be able to get listed. So that was up in the air for a while. So that was a stressful time for us. Luckily, they decided to accept us. And so we we're on the list for three and a half years. He wound up arresting the first night after his transplant. He had to actually just keep his skin open even. They couldn't close his chest at all for a few days. So it was a long recovery, but then once his pressure stabilized, he actually started recovering really quickly. He started eating. He hasn't had a feeding tube since. We waited a few months, and then he was able to go to school for the first time. He had never been in school before. We kept him home. Um, so we wanted to keep him out of public, away from germs, as much as we could, and keep him safe. The Stollery Children's Hospital is amazing. The foundation is great at attracting all the talent with all the tools they provide. So there is a great surgeon that we met before Mason's first surgery, and Dr. Ross told us that Mason's pulmonary arteries were 1.2 millimeters wide. He said he'd worked with one little as 0.7 millimeters, though he'd prefer two millimeters, but he thought he could be able to help us, and he did. Why did you need a new heart? Because my old heart didn't work. The, the uh, left, the left side of it was, was like so tiny. Yeah. What do you like to do in your backyard with your cousins? <clears throat> Go skating on our skating rink at the backyard. As a paramedic, it has changed how I do my patient care. I used to pride myself on coming up with a good plan for my patient and doing everything I could to, to make them comfortable with my plan. And I realize now that what I actually need to do is let the patient come up with a plan and I need to be the one that gets comfortable with it. So anything we can do to give them power and a sense of control over what their future holds, it does so much for them and how they're gonna heal from this mentally, I think. So Dr. Ross did his first two surgeries. He did the Norwood and then the Glen. And then the transplant was performed by Dr. Rebecca. And I remember how amazing he was. The intensivists would talk about how Mason wasn't doing well and he was gonna to have to be on the VAD for about six weeks at least. But Dr. Rebecca disagreed. And he said, I saw that ventricle myself. And I think that once we take him off this VAD, he's gonna fly. And sure enough, that very day, Dr. Rebecca was able to take him off the VAD. And Mason has been doing great ever since. Doctors Darren Freed and Jaya Nagindran designed, developed and built an organ transportation device that keeps lungs breathing and hearts pumping. The machine that breathes. Its potential in biomedical space research helped it win a NASA contest. So the lab that was created by Darren Freed and myself uh, is actually the ex vivo organ perfusion laboratory for the province, and not just for the province, but our multi-organ approach is unique within Canada for all the things we do in one lab. As soon as an organ comes out of the body and gets packaged in ice, it starts dying. Uh, once perfusion continues, oxygenated perfusion stops, the tissues don't receive what they need for basic life-sustaining uh, properties. And so continuous perfusion at normal uh, body temperature allows the tissues and the cells and so on to maintain viability and normal function as opposed to the icebox where that doesn't occur at all. Currently we're extremely limited by the ice cooler. Organs don't tolerate being outside of the body for very long. Specifically the thoracic organs, your heart and lungs, after about six hours start having irreversible damage in that cold state. The idea is that the device is small enough that it replicates the ice box in terms of size and weight, uh, and therefore could go into the back of essentially any vehicle like a taxi uh, or an airplane helicopter or what have you. So the goal is to maintain the same workflow of the current system in that right now we're used to going around with an ice cooler and the form factor of our design is exactly the same size. So it can go exactly anywhere the ice cooler used to be able to go. And what we could do now if we had the opportunity is actually consider those set of lungs in Quebec City which is over 4,000 kilometers away. We could then take about a similar distance to get to France. And so now the globe becomes a very small place. Once you have two days to make decisions, not only can you match it to, let's say, the perfect recipient for these organs here in Edmonton happens to be in Germany, 
there's no reason why we can't make that international sharing possible with good outcomes, which has not even been considered to date because we've been limited by the technology available to preserve organs. Edmonton is a, is a mecca for transplantation in Canada. It's very highly ranked for transplantation globally, in fact, not just in North America. And so when the opportunity arose to move to Edmonton, I immediately took it because I knew that this would be an opportunity for taking the research uh, to the next stage of clinical implementation. If you were to follow the traditional pathway of giving design requirements to an engineer, that process, that cycle, um, is very slow. We're talking, you know, potentially weeks or months between each of those exchanges. Whereas me working on this, developing this, something like this, and this is true not just for this particular item, but for multiple aspects, the software, the hardware, the machine, um, all of that has undergone the same sort of uh, prototyping cycle. That's something that I can work on evenings and weekends uh, and bring back to the lab for the next experiment. And if it doesn't work, then I take it back home, work on it evenings and weekends again, and bring it back for the next experiment. So the, the, the cycle is tightened up and accelerated considerably. Next up for the surgeon scientist duo, limb transplantation. One of the major limiting factors in the viability of limb transplantation is how quickly the muscle deteriorates when they go through the process of transplantation. So putting an arm on ice is a very difficult way to then perform a successful transplant and the outcomes have not been very good. Now that we're able to actually perfuse that arm and have blood flowing through it, measure its ability for nerves to be stimulated and keep it in a more normal environment, it opens up an opportunity for transplantation to become a more considered option of therapy for these amputees. Uh, we're, we're in the non-human studies right now and we are collaborating with plastic surgery here at the University of Alberta uh, to try and move things into a clinical nature over the next three to four years. The research that's being done on limb uh, perfusion uh, and uh, nerve protection, neuromuscular junction protection, uh, involved the input of Adil Ladak, one of the plastic surgeons within our department. And this represents another unique synergy uh, and collaboration between divisions within the department that otherwise wouldn't have occurred without this type of research. But given the fact that we've been able to accelerate the timeline with lungs, there's no reason why we couldn't accelerate that same time frame uh, with the limbs, with the correct setup and the, the experimental protocol, the, the strategy for getting it to clinical application. Larissa Lotner thinks big and she thinks ahead, decades into the future, into a world of cryogenic global organ banks. So the big thing that we're trying to do with my research is prevent ice from getting too big in size. So we're trying to overcome ice from shearing tissues and killing cells by forming inside the cells. As far as I know, we're the only ones in the world that are trying to cryopreserve lungs. Right now, lung transplant is the only option for patients in end-stage lung failure, and we're currently not meeting the demand. And so we need to find ways that we can keep lungs alive longer so that we can get them to recipients, and ways that we can store lungs that we don't have a match for at that point in time. Obviously, repairing the lungs is also a goal, and that's why it's interesting that we're doing things like ex vivo lung perfusion, because that has the promise of being able to regenerate lungs. So if we were to inflict some damage through crowd preservation, could we potentially mediate that by then repairing those lungs such that we can put them in patients? So the ultimate goal of my research is to be able to preserve lungs for such long periods of time that we'd be able to get them across the country or even across the world. And we could create an organ banking network where when we have lungs that aren't compatible for anybody at that given time, we can store them for indefinite periods of time before we're able to transplant them into new recipients. It's the young visionary University of Alberta researchers like Larissa who carry the torch of progress passed to them by the great leaders from the past. They are creating our future, improving lives together. <laughs>